As we know, although there's a number of exciting treatments coming up for myelofibrosis, the only curative option at this point is allogeneic stem cell transplant. When we think about allogeneic stem cell transplant, there are a number of things that we are still sorting out and I think are pretty exciting. The first one is when to do a transplant. What's the appropriate timing? Who are the appropriate candidates? There's a number of different things we're looking at that, assessing risk based, based on clinical features, based on mutations, um, as well as looking at the patient themselves. Then uh, the other, another big question is what to do with donors. I think it's very clear that matched sibling is the ideal donor to use in the setting of a bone marrow transplant, especially for myelofibrosis, which seems to be a little bit more sensitive to mismatches. But we also know that matched unrelated donor um, is probably almost equivalent. Um, and there is a lot of emerging data using haploidentical donors where we're seeing very good survivals after transplant. And at this point, I think probably haploidentical donors are probably a little bit better than even the mismatched unrelated donors based on the data, although there's never really been a head-to-head -head comparison. Um, and then the other thing to do is what to do with the spleen around the set time of transplant. Many of these patients have large spleens, and although in a perfect world what we try to do is we try to shrink the spleen with a JAK inhibitor uh, pre-transplant, the question remains, what is the role of peritransplant ruxolitinib? And what do we do in the setting where we cannot shrink the spleen appropriately with ruxolitinib? Um, so in the peritransplant setting, there's some emerging data suggesting that keeping people on a low dose of ruxolitinib through the transplant period through engraftment or up to day 30 may be, a, um, may be an approach that can help prevent some of the flare-up of stopping the Jacophy. Um, and in those patients whose spleen we cannot shrink, there does appear to be some evidence that if the spleen is particularly large, i.e. greater than 15 centimeters below the cost, left costal margin, that perhaps doing a splenectomy prior to uh, transplant may be a benefit to the patient. It does not seem to be a benefit in all comers. Um, the other thing that's being looked at is splenic radiation. And although we don't have a good comparison, comparative study between irradiating the spleen and not, it does appear to be a safe approach and may help shrink the spleen prior to transplant. The management of the spleen is, is very interesting because splenectomy has a lot of complications, um, but the hope would be is that if you can remove the spleen directly before transplant or irradiate it, that you may also help prevent disease relapse, although at this point we don't really have, conven we don't have concrete data supporting that. Yeah, no, I think the one thing that did come out of it that's going to be an interesting thing as an, on, an interesting point as an ongoing discussion is with all of these new therapies that may potentially have more disease modifying effects on the disease, will that affect the timing of transplant? Will that affect, um, you know, how will this affect the duration of length people will get from therapy? At this point, we know Ruxolitinib only has about a three year median time that it will work, at least based on the comfort studies. So perhaps with these other agents, if we have a longer duration of response, that may help us delay transplant in some patients, and in some patients, especially in older patients who we know tend to have a harder time with transplant, may help them avoid it altogether. But that is yet to be seen, and something that we certainly look forward to learning more about.